Fireside Chat, Episode 20, Looking Ahead on Labor Day, recorded August 28th, 2013. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Fireside Chat is back. It's Labor Day weekend, and it's Dan and Matt here to talk about all things Flames with you. How's your summer been, Matt? Oh, quite busy. Yeah, keeping yourself out of trouble? Yep. Nothing more fun than tiling bathroom showers. Sounds like you've had a great summer. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, the one thing we haven't done much of is you and I haven't got together to talk hockey very much over the summer, so we thought we'd uh, get together and do kind of a pre-training camp episode just to get our feelings on the flames out there and um, see what kind of news is already going on before hockey season starts. Sounds good. Back in July, you went to the Flames Rookie Evaluation Camp at COP. Um, Do you want to tell people a little bit about what that camp is? Uh, It was just... uh... Basically, each day they would do a little practice and, like, your pregame skate type drills and, you know, just to see how good certain players would stick handle or skate or things like that. And the two days they actually played games against each other. And so you were there for how much of that? Every day. Nice. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you saw, perhaps the players that stood out to you? Is there anything positive that came out of that camp so early on in the year? Uh, Yes, uh, there was about 15 or so players that looked like they were NHL caliber. Perhaps not like this season, but, you know, the potential to actually be there. You know, of course, that we don't likely have enough spots to keep all of them, but... You know, it's always good to have depth because you just never know who's going to take the next step like TJ Brody did. So having more players that actually are showing potential is always a good thing. Yeah, I mean, the more guys you've got that are showing you some sort of potential, the better chance you have at having somebody that can make the NHL, right? If we can have nine or ten defensemen all vying for two spots, if one of them doesn't turn out, there's someone else left on the list. Mm Mm-hmm. Depth is a good thing, and the Flames have for years been criticized that they don't have enough enough depth, enough farm depth, enough prospect depth. Based on what you've seen, do you think that's starting to turn around? Well, at that camp, I uh, briefly ran into Craig Conroy, and like I was mentioning to him that this was by far the best group of prospects that we've had in like the last 20 years. So, yeah, it's definitely a marked improvement. And um, was there anyone from that group that really stood out to you? Any players that you looked at and thought they're better than you thought they'd be or that just blew you away because you weren't expecting much from? Uh, The two defensemen, Brett Kulak and uh, Ryan Culkin, they actually both surprised me. They both play a somewhat similar game to TJ Brody, but in terms of where their skills are now, uh, is a lot better than what what TJ was at the same age. So, like, that really shocked me, because I wasn't expecting two defensemen that were picked in the fourth and fifth round to be two of the top players at the camp. Yeah, that surprises me, too. But, you know, I mean, maybe they have that guy now. They have that TJ Brody to look at and say, this is the model of what we have to be. And Brody was a late bloomer. I mean, it's, you know, it's someone as tough as a late bloomer to get noticed. And there was a point, I believe, where people were saying TJ Brody wasn't going to make the NHL. So maybe it's a good thing that he's so far along. Yeah. Well, the thing with Brody was that he was mostly like a forward playing defense. And then he finally, this season, learned how to be an effective defenseman. But both Culkin and Kulak and even Tyler Watherspoon, like, they already have that down pat. So if their offensive game is, you know, in a similar stratosphere, then, you know, we might ha- already have enough prospects. <laughs> so so those guys are looking better on the defensive side. Yeah. But you're not sure what their offensive game is really looking like. Yeah. Brett Kulak had the best shot of any of the defensemen 
though, like, in terms of hardness of the shot, like, it, it reminded me a little bit of Dennis Weidman's in terms of speed and accuracy, so... And, you know, as much as the offensive game is important for a defenseman, if I look on this team at the defensemen we have, at least for this year, and locked up for a few years, Weidman, Giordano, Brody, Shane O'Brien, Chris Butler, Chris Russell, Derek Smith, and Brett Carson, we have a good mix there of kind of defensive defensemen and offensive defensemen. So I think even if we brought guys into the system that weren't the most offensive defensemen, they'd still have a place on this team both this year and going forward. Yeah, it Patrick Seeloff, he definitely fits that mold. He actually reminds me somewhat of a young Adam Foote. Just exceptional positioning defensively, and even though he's only 19, I could actually see him making the flames if he has a good training camp. He was really? that good. Wow. So were there any players there that weren't flames property but were just uh, UFA invites that stood out to you? Well, there was only a handful of invitees, and the Flames signed one of them, Josh Joris. And he's not a prospect that, like, he needs to take a step or two forward in order to be a NHL contending player. Right now, like, the most direct comparison would be probably be Ben Street. Someone that'll score like 40, 50 points in Abbotsford, but, you know, not going to do much at the NHL level. Yeah. And, I mean, you've heard me say this all last year doing this podcast. You're probably going to roll, roll your eyes when I say this yet again. But we do need guys that are long shots for this team. We do need guys that perhaps aren't going to make it, but fill out a, an AHL roster and help complement the players we have down there for development. Mm-hmm. Well, you also need to have skill players on the farm, so that way, like, say, like, Marcus Granlund is going to play in the AHL this year. He, he needs somebody to play with in order to get his skill levels up to an NHL caliber. And if he's playing yeah, that's with what the I mean. equivalent guys, guys of... to complement those players that we have down there that we really want to get good. Yeah, so you need that those kind of players as well, so it's all good. Another of the walk-ons, Bryce von Brabrandt, also impressed on a couple of days and was just there on others. Uh, he might be a guy that the Flames sign next year or the year after, because he's still in the NCAA. But there was little flashes of, you know, being a quality bottom six forward. So, you know, it, one to keep your eyes on. Yeah, and even if the Flames don't sign him, I mean, the Flames and Abbotsford have pretty much been doing this uh, this really interesting thing, it seems like. Now, I'm not privy to anything, but if the Flames like a guy, they tend to get Abbotsford to sign him to an AHL deal. So it might even be another way to take a look at some of these guys when their um, you know, NCAA contracts are over. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Amongst the forwards, the one guy that uh, surprised me the most was the one that nobody ever heard of, Tim Harrison, uh, when we drafted him in the sixth round. He reminds me quite a lot of Cal Clutterbuck or Matt Martin of the Islanders. A uh, very smart player that knows when to pick his spots to hit people, and when he hits people, you know... <laughs> So it's, it, you know, one of the things that we've been lacking in our prospect depth is someone that'll just hit anything. Yeah. And maybe he's a guy, I mean, I don't know him, I haven't seen a lot of his work before, but maybe he's a guy who realized this is on the Flames' need and is coming in trying to show he can provide that so that he gets an opportunity. Mm. And plus, any time you can get Sven Berchi to high-stick you in the face after you hit him, you know, you're doing your job well. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You're agitating, but you're agitating the wrong guys. Yeah. Which, you know, if he can um, do that to other teams forwards down the road, then, you know, he's doing his job. And he is a Flames prospect, right? He's yeah, been, he the was Flames drafted. Reta retained his rights? Okay. Yeah. He's going to be in the NCAA this year as well. 
Okay. So, I mean, it's interesting to hear that because if you look down the roster since Feaster's taken over this team, he likes his NCAA guys. And we have a lot of those guys that are in the NCAA. And there's a lot of teams that don't seem to want to touch them. But to me, the extra development years while they're under, um, while their rights are still under the flames is a, a benefit sometimes. And I think especially with lower level guys to bringing in NCAA guys because you get the extra two years of rights. Yeah, and you can see, like, if, say, like a guy like John Gilmore, who the Flames picked in the seventh round, doesn't actually make steps forward in his development, you don't have to worry about signing him. But if, in, yeah. like, three years, you want to, like, he's showing that he could be the next Tory Krug or any of the, you know, the other <laughs> prospects, then, you know, go for it. Yeah, why not, right? So, a couple guys that I wanted to know if they were there and what you thought of them. Uh, Sean Monahan. I think everyone's thinking about him right now. The first round pick in the last draft for the Flames, or the first over, the sixth overall pick, the Flames' first pick, I should say. He was. He's a weird player in that he never doesn't do anything to an exceptional level, but he does everything really, really, really good, and it's consistent. Everything he does is just a step below being, like, superstar caliber, you know, talent. It's just that one step down, but it's consistent and it's good. Well, and he's only 18, too, so, you know, he has time to work on that as well. Yeah. The one player that I was most reminded of when seeing him was Patrick Marlowe, because he, too, does everything just a step below being a star player, but it's consistently good. And, like, it's just the whole package. Everything is good, but not... Like, you look at Gaudreau's shot, for example, and, like, he has a really good, quick, hard, accurate shot, and you could see him putting in 40 goals because of that. But Monahan's isn't quite that good, but it's not, like, two steps below either. So, it, you know, he might be a 25-goal to 30-goal guy down the road, not... But, I mean, even if you look at this year's draft, I mean, and the guys that were drafted before Monahan for forwards, I mean, Nathan McKinnon, Alex Barkov, uh, Elias Lindholm... There's probably a reason that Monahan was taken sixth if he still has some of those rough spots. Yeah. Well, plus with those other players, like, they each had glimpses of that next tier of skill where Monaghan doesn't really seem to have, but everything else in his game is spot on. Like, in a normal draft year, I don't think Monaghan goes sixth overall. I think he probably goes in second or third. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just that this year was rather deep, so we got lucky. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. So do you still think that he has the potential to be the player that Flames fans are expecting him to become in this in his career, to lead this team and be kind of the number one points guy on this team? And maybe not right away, because it takes time to get there, but, you know, in, let's say, five years. Well, if the Flames are going to be a contending team, you need four or five guys that you can count on as being like your go-to guys and I think he'll be one of them but I don't think he'll be the best of those ones if that makes sense like if you look at like the Kings for example like they got Kopitar, Brown, Richards, Carter and Doughty well he might be like Mike Richards not Kopitar okay so. so he can probably lead the team for what they need right now. Mm-hmm. But over time, we'll probably get you know a player that will complement him and perhaps outscore him. Um, but, you know, I mean, the key to a successful team is having guys that can assist those players and also secondary scoring. You know, we can't have one guy do it all. No, exactly. Like, if the Flames have, like, five or six, like, top-tier players, then, you know, we have a chance to be a cup contender. And with Sven Berchi and Monaghan, like, that seems to be, like, two of those players, potentially. 
So, mm-hmm. you know, like, we'll still need to get more players, like, next year at the draft and the year after, probably. But, you know, if we can get enough, you know, it, we just need balance, basically. Well, that's the key to any rebuilding team. I mean, now that Jay Feaster's calling us a rebuild, let's use that term. You know, the point of a rebuild is to restock the shelves. Mm-hmm. A couple more guys I wanted to know if they were at the uh, the evaluation camp. Was Marcus Granlin there? Yes. How did he look? Uh, he was... It's one of those things that short players and slow players tend to have to be really, really good to stick in the NHL. And Granlin is a step below average in terms of his foot speed. But the hardness and the accuracy of his shot is top-notch, so it's one of those things where he might actually make the Flames this year. It, it, he did show that well, but it, his speed might hold him back, ultimately. Short players and slow players both have a hard time sticking in the NHL, and he's a slow player, not a short player, but, um, he... Like, the rest of his game is above average. It's just that he's slow. So that might hold him back. But the rest of his game is really good. So he looked pretty polished for the guy that he is. Yeah. He would be more likely a second or third line scorer. Not a, you know, like a hoodler type. Not a top end guy. But you need those as well. Which we need too. We need to fill up four lines, right? Yeah. And I guess the other guys that I wanted to uh, see if they were there, and I'm not sure if they were or not, was the players that we got back from the Jerome McGinley trade. Um, Agostino and Hanowski were both there. Hanowski's the skating stride is a lot better. It's not awkward like it was in those few games he played last year. So that, you know, it makes him a little bit better. He, he could play... This year, it depends on his camp, though. And Agostino, he had flashes of good play and was also invisible at times. So, you know, like, he's got a little bit to work on as well. Both players are likely third or fourth line guys, not, you know, your scorer guys. So, you know... So not the player's... Flames fans were probably expecting to get back from Jerome McGinley. No, they're not going to, like, if either of them scores 20 goals in a season, I'd be shocked, quite frankly. But they're solid enough where they both should be in the NHL. You know, it, whether it's a third or a fourth line spot. Okay, so they should be there, but they're probably not... The players that we were thinking, even the two of them put together, it doesn't sound like, are the players the Flames fans were expecting to get back from Jerome Aginla. Well, you know, the thing is, is that even Marion Hosa, when he was traded from Atlanta to Pittsburgh, they didn't really get much of anything for him either. So, you know, getting Morgan Klimchuk as well in that trade, you know, that and is enough like he will be a top six player yeah yeah you're probably right um last guy i'll ask you about um probably perhaps one of the most interesting flames goalies to me right now is red obara was he at the camp yeah and how do you say the most uh direct comparison would be henrik carlson but Henrik Carlson that knows that you have to move your hands and your feet. So Red Obara didn't do karate? No, but he can move a little bit more in his net, and he did make quite a few good secondary saves. Like, he does okay. give up rebounds, but he did make a few good second saves as well, so he'll be a backup, whether or not he'll be a good backup or... You know, a fringe starter, you know, that's up to him. But, you know, he's an NHL-caliber goalie, but, 
you know, what level. Yeah, well, when you said that he reminds you of Carlson, that's the first thing I thought there was, okay, this guy's probably destined then to be a, a career backup. Yeah. He, he's better than Carlson, but not by leaps and bounds where, like, he's in the conversation to be the starter. Okay. Which, again, we need... You know, maybe he's a great AHL starter. Maybe he takes more of the Leland Irving path and he plays a lot of his career in the AHL. Yeah. Um, Because I think the Flames are going to have a crowded crease over the next couple years. And that's good. Uh, The one player that I think was actually the best player of the whole bunch was Jonathan Gillies. Um, He, honestly, if he wasn't in the NCAA, I would actually have him as the favorite to be the starter this year. And really? he is just amazing. Like the er, his positioning, it's great. The only weakness in his game is his lateral movement, and he's about as quick as Luongo is side to side. Not great, but not bad. And like that's the only weakness. He's got a really quick blocker, a really quick glove. He's huge. He's like six five, two thirty, or whatever. Like, and he's quick getting up, moving, you know, up and down. And, like, he was actually hugging the post uh, during one of the drills, and his shoulder was, like, two inches below the crossbar. So if he's playing out of the crease at all, like, there's absolutely zero to shoot at. So I think he'll end up being the starter down the road a couple years. That's good, and that gives him time, it sounds like, that he needs to develop a little bit and not have the team rush him through his uh, NCAA career or even probably through his AHL stint that he's likely to have because we have a lot of goaltenders ahead of him on the depth chart, I'd imagine. Uh, I'd actually have him first or second behind Ramo, actually. He's that good. I know that you're a big fan of Brassois. Would you put him above or below Brassois? Oh, Brassois and Orio and the rest of the goalies aren't even in the same stratosphere of really? talent. Like, it, it's a clear separation. It's not even close. Okay, it's so like he's talking a guy that really your, your socks off. Yeah, it's talking an NHL starter that's good versus an AHL starter. That's the wow. the skill level difference. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> I'm he's, surprised to hear that. Yeah, he's the best goalie prospect that the Flames have had since Trevor Kidd. And that was, you know, when Trevor Kidd had a possibility of actually being a good goaltender. Yeah. Wow. Anything else about the evaluation camp you want to share? Uh, n- nothing much. It was fairly routine, but, you know, the overall talent level of the team was pretty good. And even the walk-ons weren't terrible, but, you know, like, you could see that the Flames' actual prospects were a lot better in yeah. most cases. Like, they weren't bad, but ours were actually better, so, which is good. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a reason that those guys are are free agents, the guys that are walk-ons. There's a reason they probably didn't get drafted or signed by anybody. Mm-hmm. So I guess with the rookie camp over, um, we should probably start looking ahead to training camp. Now, I imagine we'll we'll do another episode that's going to really detail training camp once we get into it. But are there any players you're looking forward to seeing at training camp? Any of those guys you saw at the evaluation camp that you think have a legitimate shot to knock an NHL guy out of their spot for this team? Well, during the prospect evaluation camp, it was uh, mentioned that if... Uh Brookie and an, a veteran player are performing at an equivalent level. They will waive the or trade the veteran guy in lieu of the young kid. So, you know, it's basically a free for all. If any of the kids that are, you know, under contract in that show that they can be in the NHL, the Flames will give them that opportunity. And that and that was told to you by a flame scout, right? Yeah. Well, it was mentioned also by Conroy in one of the interviews as well, so Okay, so sounds like the Flames are really pushing towards bringing the young players onto this team and getting a bit of a youth movement going now that they've admitted that they have to do a rebuild. Yeah. 
Well, the thing is, with having 15 to 20 guys that at that development camp that looked like they could be NHLers, having as many of them actually getting a shot in the NHL could, will help accelerate the rebuild because you never really know until they get there whether or not they're an NHL player. Like TJ Brody, for example didn't look very good until he actually got a taste of the NHL, and then he improved a lot after that. So, you know, the more that we have more opportunities that the kids are given, the more that they'll take it and run with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's really what I want to be seeing right now based on where the Flames are at in their development cycle. I want to see those kids get an option and get a chance to play because I think we have to be honest we're not expecting a very good team to be ice this coming year I mean they're in the first year of a rebuild in the first year of a long development cycle so I think this is the perfect time to say you know what let's put all the young guys out there and learn um, how to be NHLers exactly and with having several players that are third and fourth line guys like Reinhardt and Horak and Hanowski you know, like, they'll take some spots away from the Tim Jackmans and the Steve Bajans of the world. And guys like Granlin, Berchi, Monaghan, uh, Klimchuk, and Poirier, like, those guys will more take spots away from guys like Stempniak and Camilleri down the road. Yeah, and I think that's the thing to stress is down the road. They're not going to take those jobs this year, I'd hope. No, like the only way that that many player, young players play is if we hit injury troubles, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, it, it, they will happen, but hopefully not that many all at once. <laughs> and you've heard me say this before, what I want the Flames to do is the opposite of what I think the Oilers have done, which is bring in a whole team of just young guys. I think we do need that good mix of veterans, the Camilleries, the Glenn Crosses, the uh, Hoodlers, even you know, the Brian Giordano. McGratton, you know, the McGrattons. Yeah, of the guys that have been at the NHL level and can help mentor these guys. I don't want the blind to lead the blind, if you will, where we have a bunch of guys who don't know the NHL game trying to learn it together. Mm -hmm. And, like, that was one of the reasons why I think it was imperative to get rid of, uh, say, Alex Tangay. So that way you have players that play with the right, you know, mix of skill and drive where Tange is not really that type of player. Yeah, and I really I really like the Tange deal. I think that we got back a lot of players that are going to be instrumental in the next couple of years here during the rebuild. Yeah. And plus Flames fans should, you know, give the team a break like they were not going to be good. So cheer more for like positive steps like say Berchi learning the NHL game and scoring more regularly, and perhaps Kandari and Backlund, you know, stepping up. Yeah, because in the past, the team has come out and said they're a playoff quality team, and their goal is the playoffs. So I think Flames fans had a right, in a lot of senses, to be upset when the team wasn't meeting their expectations. But when the team is coming out and saying, we're in a rebuild. You know, like you said, and you and I talked about this before we started broadcasting, we have to start looking at the positives, looking at, you know, who's developing well, who's getting more ice time. You know, like you said, cheer for the, you know, young defenseman who's playing 10, 15 minutes a game instead of the five he's usually getting. Cheer for the goalie that's, you know, played his first or second game and got a couple wins and is looking more confident. Mm hmm. Exactly. And, and don't be surprised to see some of those young players. I think, get demoted again to the AHL, not because they're not good, just because we want everyone to get a shot. Yeah, and plus, with a lot of players, they quite frequently go back to the AHL a couple of times before sticking full-time. Like, it's usually only the upper-tier top players that, like, once they're in the NHL, they actually stay there. So... yeah. You know, like, seeing, say, like, Hanowski or even Berchi going back down isn't out of line. It, you know, it'd be disappointing to see Berchi go down, but you know what I mean. Like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be entirely surprising, though. No, and I think there's something to be said for the players going down and learning 
how to take that as well. You know, learning that, okay, sometimes I am going to need to go down and not to throw a hazy fit when that happens. Yeah, and you need to learn, really. And, yeah. like, if you're getting demoted and thing, to I'd the AHL... I'd rather a guy goes down to the AHL and plays 20 minutes a night than stays here and plays maybe 5 minutes a night. Yeah, and it, the more that you learn as a player, the better off you'll be. So if you take it as a learning experience instead of, you know, being all pissed off that you're getting sent to the AHL, then, <laughs> you know, you'll be better in the long run. <laughs> Yeah, and I think right now the key thing, if I was the GM, is just finding a place for these guys to play. And I know the Flames just got a new uh, ECHL affiliate, which is the Alaska Aces. So you might even see some guys start to go down there. And again, if you're in the ECHL, I wouldn't say, oh crap, my career's over. Perhaps the best place for you to play because you wouldn't get the time in Abbotsford. Yeah, well, like Brossois, he's likely going to be in Alaska to start the year. So, yeah. yeah. Just because of the yeah. amount of goalies, so... Exactly. Yeah. No, and plus, with the amount of depth that we do have, it's unlikely that we'll be able to shoehorn them all in in Abbotsford and Calgary, so, you know, they're going to have to play elsewhere as well. Yeah, there's lots of options. I mean, you can loan one or two guys out to other teams who maybe need a defenseman or something like that. You can put them in the ECHL. There's there's a few options out there for what the Flames can do. I think anyone that's WHL eligible, or I should say CHL eligible, will probably be sent back. Yeah. The only two that I could see sticking are Sealoff and Monaghan, but you know they'd have to have a really good camp. Yeah, I mean, if they've got a shot at the NHL, they'll probably stick around. But if they're right on the bubble, I can see them just getting sent back. You were mentioning the goalie depth, and I think to me that's one of the most interesting things about the upcoming training camp is going to be looking at that goaltending race. I mean, it's been a long time since we've had a question in our mind going into training camp, who's going to be the goaltender, even who's going to be the backup. You know, normally we know who the starter is, is Kipper, and we have a pretty good idea who the backup is. Irving's already shown up, but always we knew he's not going to get the job because we have someone else we've recently brought in. At this point, do you think it's fair to say Kipper's not coming back, Matt? I would probably be surprised more so if he did come back than anything. He's already said that he's not going to, which, knowing his attitude and that, he's likely done. Yeah, I wouldn't be angry if he did come back. No. But, you know, I think we have to move on. I think now is the right time to move on. I think if he doesn't want to come back, great. The Flames have been preparing for this. I mean, they have goaltender depth now. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, maybe it's the right time to say, we'll hand the reins over to a young guy and get him to learn along with this team. Mm-hmm. And plus, ha- having Ramo as the default starter, in my mind, you know, he's 26 or 27, so he's right in that right age group for... If you're going to pull a kipper where you come out of nowhere and become an awesome starter, that's usually the time. So, yeah. yeah it- I think one, one of the reasons I'm not as um, upset with kipper leaving right now is I think Joey McDonald was the right guy for the Flames to re-sign as the backup because it still gives Ramo, let's assume Ramo is going to be a starter, a veteran to work with. Yeah. Yeah, you know, McDonald hasn't had the accolades Kipper has, but he's been around the NHL for a long time. You know, and I he, I think he started playing in 2007 and he played for the Wings, the Bruins, the Leafs, the Wings, like he's played for top line, he's played for top flight teams and he knows how the NHL game works. Mhm. And he's been a starter before with the Islanders, so you know, like he's not totally inexperienced. He's basically like he's like this generation's Jamie McLennan. You're really it's dependable. Not a bad way to put it. Yeah. Backup, not gonna blow you away, but does his job no. well. But that's exactly what I was gonna say too. He's a dependable backup. I don't think, and I think Flames fans will have to get this out of their mind. We're used to our starter playing seventy to seventy-five games a year. I don't see that happening with um, Ramo coming in. So I think Flames fans are gonna have to get used to having. Um, Joey in net more, but I think that he's reliable when we do put him in. It's not like McElhaney where, oh crap, he's in, we might as well turn the game off, we're going to lose. 
I think he's going to be a reliable backup. That Yeah, he's going to lose some games. Everybody does. But he's a guy that I think more often than not, you're going to go, okay, he's in. Yeah, he's not our starter, but he's still a reliable goaltender. Yeah, and I could even see Barra getting 10 starts or so over the course of the year as well. You know, yeah, just I think the trick there him... might come with waivers, because both Ramo and McDonald would have to clear waivers to go down, I believe. Yeah. It's one of those things where you might just, uh, for like the back half of the season, just carry the three-headed monster and yeah, <laughs> run with it. Well, that's where I think if somebody does get hurt, like let's say McDonald were to get hurt, you bring Barra up, I think it might be a perfect time to just say, let's start him. Yeah. You know, let's give Carey some nights off and let's just start whoever they bring up as the backup. So, and, uh, you know, I could see the Flames putting uh, McDonald on waivers at some point, too probably fairly certain he's not going to get picked up but if he does they've got other options you know whether it's within their franchise already or someone else that's a ufa or an rfa something like that but sometimes i know the flames have had guys they've put on waivers just to have that leverage of being able to put them down if need be yeah well plus the thing is is that with each of the goalies that we have currently if they're not cutting it it's not a big deal to go out and find somebody else. Yeah. You know, like, there's about 70 goalies that are of McDonald or better caliber, so... Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, if you put if you put McDonald on waivers and somebody picks him up and you said you do want a backup, I'm sure that we could trade for one. I'm sure we could find one on the RFA market at some point or even, you know, look for someone that's playing in another league. Like you know, like you said, there's a lot of there's a lot of experienced NHL backups that can be had for cheap or very little. Yeah, there's lots of different options available. So like, it, so it's I wouldn't not be really too worried. Worry. No, it's not a position that we need to worry about too much. At least for right now, you know, like down the road, like if uh, the Flames sign Gillies next year or the year after, and like he's just doing okay then perhaps look at trading for somebody. But, you know, till then, it's really not important at all. I think that's a position that the Flames are going to have to go year by year with, and each year they're going to have to reevaluate what they have, what their goaltenders are doing for them, how well they're doing, and decide if they want to continue on with that set of goalies or tweak it at all. And I don't think it's one that we're going to have a long time to... Um, you know, read into the future like you might with the forward or the defenseman. I think there's so many young guys, and as we know, young goaltenders are, um, I don't want to say flaky, but they're hard to read and hard to know what's going to happen with them. Yeah. And worst case scenario, there's always Breeze off, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. He's been bought out. He'd probably come play for cheap. Um, and just on the goalie note, I'm sure everyone's heard, but the goalie pad size um, is going to be reduced this year. The goalies will be be able to wear a pad that goes no higher than nine inches above his knee. So I personally don't think that's going to have much effect on things, but some goaltenders are thinking that it will. So I well, guess we'll, well see. Luongo will lose like a half inch off his pad, so I don't really see that making a huge difference. No. Like, that's not even the width of a finger. Like, give me a break. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no way that, I mean, it's going to make as big a deal as I think some goaltenders think it's going to. It'd be, it'd be silly to think it's going to change the game or change things that much for any goaltender. No. Like, if they knocked it down so, like, it can only extend, like, an inch or two above the knee, then that would do something. You know, but, yeah, that's... Nine inches above the knee is still a lot of pad. Yeah. Like, for an average person, like, that's midway up their thigh. Like, give me a break. Yeah, I'm. I'm it's funny you said that, because as I'm sitting here, I'm measuring from my knee to my thigh, and yeah, I probably wouldn't be able to walk if I had pads that high. There's a lot they can do, <laughs> still. Uh, yeah, there is. And, and that's the thing. I think with the Flames relying on young goaltenders, too, young goaltenders are more adaptable. Mm-hmm. So it's probably not going to hurt us that much at all. No. So, Matt, I think um, we should have another episode fairly shortly about 
the training camp once training camp starts and we see what everybody brings? Well, actually, perhaps having one uh, after the rookie tournament next week and then, like, between that and the camp. Yeah, that that would be a good idea. So we'll plan on that. We'll plan on broadcasting again right after the rookie tournament. Yeah. And I guess my hope at this point is just that we see the veterans come in with a drive to play and everyone being in shape and ready for the NHL season. Yeah. And plus, you know, I'm I think hoping... there might be some guys that get lazy going, oh, this team is rebuilding. I don't need to be in shape, but I want everyone to play their best and be ready to go. Yeah, because I'm hoping that guys like Camilleri, Stajan, and Stempniak have a really good season, so that way we can get more first-round picks at the trade deadline. Yeah, and I th- I also want them to have a good season because I think it's going to help out. Like, let's say Monahan ends up on a line with... I could see Monahan with Camilleri and Glencross, perhaps. If they have a good season, he's going to look better, and he's going to learn more as well. Yeah, exactly. It, it, the so more every, that everybody everyone needs does to do good, well. Yeah. Everybody that does well, it just makes it that much easier. It benefits everybody else. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention him at all earlier, but Corbin Knight, he actually looks like he'll be the third line center to start the year. He was oh, really? very good. I'm glad to hear that, because he was a guy that we traded not much for, and I'd never really heard of him, but... To see the Flames are being able to scout those kind of guys and bring them in, and that they have NHL, um, I guess not readiness, but they're yeah, I guess ready for the NHL and ready to step into that kind of role. That's really good to hear. Yeah, I don't think his offensive abilities are gonna be like a fifty or sixty point guy, but he could be a fairly good forty point third line center that wins like fifty five to sixty percent of the faceoffs. So yeah. You need do you that. think he's a career third liner? Or do you think he's a third liner for now? Uh, well, the Flames' depth at center kind of sucks, so I think he's going to get pigeonholed at third line center, regardless of how ready he is for that. <laughs> okay. So. And do you think that going forward with the Flames in their rebuild, that he would, if they got stronger at center, he'd still maintain a position yes. there? Do you think he's a guy that's. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Okay. He reminds so he's not just me, a guy that he's there for now. He reminds me a bit of a slightly less offensively skilled David Boland. Okay. So, you know. I'd take that. Yeah. Solid, generally, basically. Which you need from a third line guy, and he can win a lot of faceoffs. He was really good at that. Yeah, that's good to hear. Something that's and been Matt, foreign I, <laughs> for a while. Yeah, well, speaking of that, when you said Dave Boland, I don't want to uh, dwell on it too much, but your, I guess, prediction in the off season that we'd end up having Nystrom come back really didn't happen. No. Are you sad? Did you cry? Not really. For what he and Ferret signed for. They're good on other teams. <laughs> That's what I thought, too. As soon as I saw that contract, I thought, I don't want that. Yeah, we have the cap room, but I don't really want that contract. Yeah, he signed, what, almost $2.3 million or something like that? Like that I think so, that, yeah. Like, that's nearly Glenn Cross's contract. Like, give me a break. Yeah, exactly. If if we could have gotten him for 800000 or less, I would have brought him in. Well, even, up like, one and a half to two, I would have been fine with. But, you know, when you're getting up in the second third line scorer types and you're a 10 to 15 point per year guy yeah no fair enough well matt i guess we'll talk to you um when i will officially kick off the second season of fireside chat when we talk either the next episode um after the rookie tournament or during training camp yep it's good to be back and thinking about hockey isn't it definitely Have a good week, everybody. Have a good one. And don't forget to um, follow us on Twitter again. I know a lot of people started doing that. Um, You'll get all the announcements as to when the new shows are going to come out. Um, You'll get information on new articles on the site and just general Flames news or through Facebook. And we also offer that. Um, You can find those links on our website at firesidechat.ca. Have a great week. Take care.